I am happy to welcome all of you back uh, to our today's talk on, on the Greater Indo series. And uh, we are very happy to welcome today Dr. Oro Didier. She is the director of the French Archaeological Mission in the Indus Basin and head of the Indus Baluchistan program at the French National Center for Scientific Research. She specializes on the society, material, cultures and interactions in South Asia during the proto-historic period with a focus on the Bronze Age and the Indus Valley civilization. She has conducted excavations and explorations in Ketchmakran in Baluchistan in Pakistan in 2001 to 2006 under the leadership of the late Roland Besenval and collaborated with the late Jean-Francois Jarich in the publications on Merga, Noshari and Nindovari oil substantial excavations uh, in Pakistan as well. She has also participated in various excavations in Turkmenistan, the Sultanate of Oman and in India. Now since 2015, Dr. Didier and her team have been working on the question of the emergence and development of the Indus civilization in the lower Indus Valley, excavating the site of Chanhudaro in Lower Sindh, and conducting surveys in Sindhkoistan in cooperation with the Culture, Tourism, Antiquities and Archives Department in the government of Sindh. So she is one in a limited number of projects which are presently working in Pakistan, actually international projects. And um, she has taken up the, the old work conducted uh, as an old site and she will present now today the amazing insights and the new information on the organization um, of the Indo civilization in that region. Thank you very much, Oro, for having prepared the talk today and being with us. And I hand over now the word to you. Um, Thank you. Sorry, sorry. Um, one, uh, one remark to the audience, please, as usually uh, pose your questions into the question and answer section in uh, the icon in the, in the folder, which is on the lower screen. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I would like to thank Professor Ute Franke and Professor Prabhaka for inviting me to speak today. This talk is um, going to be focused on Indus urbanism and architecture with, uh, in the first part, a general overview on the urban layout and main architectural features of Indus cities. And um, in the second part, I will mainly refer to the sites of Moshero in Baluchistan and Chanudaro in Sindh as uh, important examples of urban development during the first centuries of the Indus civilization. In this respect, I wished to associate as co-authors my colleagues from the French mission, um, David Samento Castillo, Alexandre Daz, Pascal Moni, and Gonzague Kivron. They all significantly contributed to the results that will be presented here. So um, after more hundred years of research starting at Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro, we know a great deal about the Indus civilization known as the first urban phenomenon in South Asia. In past decades, the Indus studies have seen major advances in both Pakistan and India that provided new insight into its settlement patterns and urban and architectural developments. And um, we have also a not, uh, now a much better understanding of its craft producing economies and interregional interaction systems. More recently, significant progress has also been made in the knowledge of its subsistence strategies in both urban and rural contexts and the impact of climate change from its emergence around 26, 2500 BC to its decline and transformation at the very beginning of the second millennium BC. However, crucial questions still need to be answered. As uh, Cameron Petrie reminded us in the first talk of this uh, Greater Indus Lectures, Behind the apparent uniformity of part of Indus material culture, including elaborate crafts, lie a chronogeographical variability probably underestimated 
and uh, patterns of regional cultural diversity and urban developments. One of the major challenges is to better understand how the Indus civilization integrated communities from diverse geographical regions and cultural tradition in this expensive territory. To illustrate this point, I placed uh, on this map credited to uh, Greg Purcell some of the distinctive pottery styles that occurred during the periods before the Indus civilization, generally grouped um, into what it is called the uh, early Harappan period. While there is a significant transformation of the settlement patterns from northwestern regions to Gujarat uh, in the middle of the third billion BC, some of these ceramics tradition disappeared completely or they were incorporated into a quite standardized Indus model. But all the traditions continued not without evolution and coexisted with the Indus ceramic tradition. Other regions or boundary cultures also saw the forming of uh, hybrid pottery styles integrating both local and Indus features. And similarly, there was a functional differentiation of settlements. The city, the way the cities were structured was also variable as were linkages between major cities, towns and villages. Another major challenge in Indus studies is also to better understand the internal evolution of the Indus civilization over the course of 700 years. Several major projects in Pakistan and in India led to divide what it is generally called the mature Harappan period here in uh, three sub periods based on stratigraphical data and a detailed investigation of pottery and artifacts. These periods were uh, evidenced, for example, at Amri, Noshero, Harappa, Dolavira, but also at Kanmer or uh, Farmana. Each sub-period of the Indus civilization can be associated with a distinctive painted pottery style, uh, as it is shown on this slide uh, based on the study by my colleague Gonzague Kivron. It should be noticed that the painted pottery style of the first Indus period here um, is uh, very sophisticated and quite homogeneous. It seems to occur uh, in all excavated sites. The painted style of the second Indus period is less sophisticated and shows more variations among sites. A regionalization phenomenon clearly begins to emerge during the third Indus period, which sees new styles integrate the material assemblages, such as the Juka style, for example, in Sindh, the Kuli B style in Baluchistan. However, Despite an increasing control of stratigraphic sequences and the provision of new data, the urban period is still too often approached as a monolithic entity with no evolution over time. And this is also the reason why the chronocultural sequences established in certain regions need to be further explored in order to better understand the processes of local formation and um, urban development, but also to identify the common features that link the different regions, spatially and uh, chronologically. This is one of our objectives by resuming new excavations at Chanudaro. This uh, program carried out in cooperation with the Culture, Tourism and Antiquities Department, Government of Sindh, aims to shed uh, a new light on the architectural and craft developments during the first Indus period, which is still little known in Sindh, and uh, their evolution over time. Before presenting this new data, uh, I think it is first uh, appropriate to give a general overview of our knowledge on Indus urbanism and architecture, especially for uh, the participants who may be less familiar with the subject. This knowledge is based on uh, data from large urban centers that have been excavated, such as Harappa, Mwanjo-Daro, Dolavira, and Rakigari, with an estimated population of 20 to 50,000, but also from regional towns uh, such as Kalibangan, Banawali, Farmana, and Chanudaro, and smaller towns and villages such as Noshero, 
Lothal, Sokotada, Aladino, Canmer, or Chicago. There are many, many other sites. Most excavated sites consist of several mounds formed by a succession of archaeological deposits, sometimes created over a long period of time. And uh, I will not discuss here the concept of the high place and lower town, which uh, does not always make sense with regards to the installation of architectures on older occupations. Among the most defining and impressive characteristic of the Indus civilization is, of course, the establishment of planned cities with buildings lined up along streets and lanes oriented to the cardinal points. Their grid-like plan uh, were conceived according to an innovative and hierarchical network of sewage drainage channels designed on the scale of the city. These uh, sewage drainage systems uh, was built to control waste disposal, to facilitate its evacuation, and to prevent encroachments of floodwaters. It was stated that uh, in the cities were built over systems of massive artificial platforms designed to raise the level of building, to prevent the decay of brick from the saline water table, and uh, to prevent disruptions from uh, the floodwaters. However, we will see later that this model doesn't fit at Chanudaro. Overall, the city layout shows uh, the dense nature of occupation. Um, the cities were divided into separate neighborhoods, mainly made of uh, residential areas, and often surrounded by enclosure or uh, perimeter walls, which were reused over time. Perimeter walls were mainly made of mud brick of various sizes, and their thickness was variable. Except for a few sites located at the boundary of the Indus territory, the walls were not defensive, but they controlled access to the city and to its different neighborhoods. The walls could be entered by uh, gateways, uh, areas with, uh, depending on sites, narrow or large uh, passageways, ramps, corridors, side room, and even uh, large square bastions like in De La Vira. Most of Indus civilization settlements in the alluvial plain were constructed of molded mud brick, which requires uh, quite a lot of uh, labor investment. Um, the brick size differs depending on their use, for example, for building enclosure walls or housing structures, and it can change over time, but uh, the ratio still uh, remains the same. Different types of masonry are observed, as it is shown on this example from Lothal at, at the top right here. Fire bricks were used from the beginning of the Indus civilization, in particular for building hydraulic structures like wells, drains, and base platforms, but it seems that uh, their widespread use occurs during the second half of the Indus period only. Large cities such as Mohenjo-Daro and regional towns uh, such as Chengdu-Daro were built entirely with fire brick during this period. How many, uh, however, sorry, many sites like Noshero in Baluchistan or Farmana were built entirely with mud brick during the whole Indus civilization period. When stone was available in local environments, it was largely used in addition to bed brick, uh, like for example in Dolavira, uh, which undoubtedly offers the most impressive uh, stone architectures of the greater Indus Valley. Stone is also used in smaller towns and villages uh, in the alluvial plain, for example, for Tiji here, or uh, Aladino, or uh, uh, Nerikalat in Baluchistan. As mentioned before, the settlements are designed according to the sewage drainage system, and uh, different types of structures uh, have been built, including gutters, pipes, open or uh, covered drains of various sizes, as well as uh, here uh, large uh, in large cities, um, these large drains with covered arch, which uh, have been identified only uh, during the second half of the Indus period. Here you have also a rare example of wooden drain, uh, which was um, excavated in uh, Kalibangan. 
excess pits were built to avoid uh, clogging. Uh, they can be constructed in bricks, like on this example from Mohenjo Daro. But the Indus people also used ceramic vessels uh, used as uh, sump pots that could be replaced by setting a new pot on the top of the old one. Many sites provided uh, elaborate hydraulic structures such as uh, wells built with weight shaped bricks and found, uh, for example, in very large numbers at Mohenjo Daro, in uh, each neighborhoods uh, in private or public areas. In contrast, um, the wells, for example, they are quite few in Harappa and uh, they are totally absent on other sites. Whether they are large cities or small towns and villages, uh, many excavated sites had water tanks and reservoirs connected to drains. Uh, some of them can be uh, monumental, like uh, this uh, stone light reservoir excavated into the natural bedrock at Dolavira. The water management system was also adapted to local environmental conditions. Uh, in dry environments, dams uh, were built at the outer border of the city, like in Dolavira. But we also know a uh, huge retaining dams called uh, Gababens, uh, known in southern Baluchistan from the late fourth millennium BC um, and early third millennium. When we compare uh, the large inter cities to smaller towns and villages, uh, one of the major differences is the presence and the variability of non residential or public structures. Although the great inter cities have not yielded any remains that can be clearly identified as a, a centralized palace or temples, um, they often have monumental structures that could be part of a symbolic behavior. This is a case, for example, uh, with the great bass at Mohenjo Daro, interpreted for some scholars as a reservoir and for others as a ritual structure. Mohenjo Daro also includes other monumental or community structures like uh, this building with small uh, cell like rooms called the college or the granary, which, like that of Harappa, is probably not a granary but a large uh, storage structure. I turn now to a brief description of the residential areas. Although there is no standard house forms for the urban period. Uh, the general pattern observed on most sites is a flat roofed structure with one or two stories and a central open uh, space or courtyard surrounded by um, rooms and cells of various sizes. But there was a significant variation in uh, the house sizes. Mohenjo Daro, in particular, evidenced several large houses interpreted as elite residences. For example, this one in, um, in HRB area, which has been described in an excellent article by Massimo Vidali. Uh, these are other examples of large houses or possible elite residences from Mohenjo Daro. Whatever the size, um, houses contained hearth and kitchen areas, generally in uh, open space or in a room at the corner of the building. And uh, most of the houses also had bathing platforms built uh, either as uh, separate rooms or in the corner of multipurpose rooms. These uh, bathing platforms had floors mainly in fire bricks, but some had also floors made of large stones pebbles, pottery shirts, or uh, decorated tiles like this one. Their waste mostly flowed into drain that ran along the rear edge of the streets or uh, into cesspits and so or some pots for refuse. And uh, in addition, some sites provided uh, evidences of latrines. So at this point of the presentation, we can see that there are uh, diagnostic features and architectural constants that link sites in terms of town planning, um, building techniques, water management systems, um, house patterns. Um, however, there are also differences in terms of general layout, um, uh, the use of mud brick or fire brick, 
and also the number and variability of public or monumental structures. As mentioned earlier, our knowledge of the development and evolution of Indus urbanism over time must be deepened, as well as the role and contribution of the different regions to the formation of Indus urbanism. Noshero, located near Amergar in the Ketch Plain, was one of the most extensively excavated sites in Pakistan for uh, studying the beginning of the Indus civilization and perhaps one of the most interesting sites to address the question of the incipient urbanism in the western margin of the greater Indus Valley and um, its evolution over the long term. The settlement, which was uh, excavated under the direction of Jean-François Jarige and Catherine Jarige, um, was founded around 3000 uh, BC, and it continued to be inhabited during the whole Indus period. The pre-Indus occupation that you have here on this slide, corresponding to period one, showed the gradual establishment of many Indus features, uh, although the settlement is not yet subdivided into quadrangular blocks. Period 1C architectural levels excavated in the North Mount here um, provided in particular very well preserved uh, mud brick houses like on this example uh, that you have here on the top right. These houses are uh, by many aspects prototypes of Indus houses with courtyards uh, surrounded by uh, rectangular rooms and uh, small storage cells, uh, some of them uh, full of ceramics. Here uh, is a selection of pottery and artifacts found uh, in the period 1C levels. Some of these period 1C houses had uh, stairways to reach an upper floor and uh, also traces of wooden doors, window lintels, and imprints of wooden beams or uh, superstructures in vegetal material like on the right here. If no remains of drains were uncovered at Noshero for this period, excavations provided with uh, small rooms with floors uh, made of pebbles and uh, small openings for uh, water drainage. Whether it is generally accepted that the sewage drainage system appears in the greater Indus from the beginning of the urban period, it should be noted that uh, several structures have also been identified in pre-Indus contexts in other regions. For example, uh, drains are reported at Dom Sadat period three, so in Balochistan, um, but also in pre-Indus contexts at Rakigari here and uh, Kalibangan one. Going back to Noshero, it is um, during the pre-Indus period 1D, dated uh, between uh, 26 and 2500 BC, that the new inhabitants and builders constructed large foundation walls or a massive retaining walls in mud brick to assure the stability of the residential areas and to provide a horizontal plane without leveling the old walls. You have an example of this big retaining wall here, which is, uh, I think, seven meters uh, wide. Although the elevation of period 1D houses were not preserved, uh, Jean-Claude Jarry and his team found their basements under the form of storage compartments. You have their plan here uh, on the top. And these compartments were filled with an abundant um, ceramic materials and uh, figurines. Here is a selection of period 1D pottery and figurines. And um, regarding the ceramics, it is very interesting to note that the craft tradition during this period is in continuity with the earlier periods. But during this period 1D, the ceramic vessels also incorporate some of the stylistic components that are characteristic of the Indus iconography. For example, this uh, fish scale uh, motifs or this uh, uh, interlacing cycle motif here. During period two, which corresponds to the beginning of the Indus period, the new settlements was installed on period one year ruins, but also further south uh, in untouched area. 
uh, these uh, locations are represented here. I mean, the um, excav architecture is excavated for the second first in this period is represented here in uh, orange color. Um, in a partially excavating housing block uh, here on the right side, um, seven successive levels of housing were uh, identified. To the south here, uh, the French team also discovered two large uh, mud brick walls. One of these walls, this one here represented also here on the right, um, had a gateway of uh, three meters wide that could be reached by a ramp, uh, which was rebuilt several times. We have um, reconstruction of uh, this gate with its ramp here on the top right. Other major uh, building works have been undertaken during this period um, below the Northern Mound, which is here. Uh, a massive structure was built to probably support a system of ramps in order to access the residential areas located here on the top of the mound. Against the north facade of this big uh, wall, there was a big circular structure uh, here, uh, which is probably a silo and also a reservoir uh, which was connected to a fire brick drain built on a system of large stone. You have it here on uh, the right. And the continuity of this drain uh, located here was also found uh, 80 meters further south here. Huge foundation work uh, were also carried out on the top of the mound, and uh, it is interesting to note that this foundation uh, consists of wooden beams arranged in parallel between blocks of large pebbles. I think this um, uh, this is also the case for a monumental architecture of uh, the his I mean some of the building of the historic period in India. Finally, um, a monumental building with massive walls and a large entrance corridor was constructed on the top of the northern mound, several meters uh, above the plain, but only a small portion of this uh, big uh, building uh, was excavated. You can see its reconstruction uh, here. The subsequent period three, uh, corresponding to the southern Indus period, uh, sees extensive leveling work in the southern part of the site uh, to install uh, these large rectangular housing blocks, which were separated by lanes here and also uh, by streets to the north and south. These uh, blocks were, um, I mean, other a group of blocks, uh, but arranged uh, along the east west axis, were also uh, settled here uh, further north. In these blocks, uh, the housing units, uh, quite a modest in size, uh, show a regular in this pattern and include quite identical facilities. They provided semi-buried jars or jars installed in the mud brick compartments, uh, earth, kitchen area, always um, installed in the northeastern corner of houses, and also um, courtyards and basin platforms. Here is um, also a selection of pottery and artifacts from this period. And uh, to know more about these blocks of the uh, period three at Nochero, I uh, will uh, refer to an excellent article uh, by Catherine Jarich on this uh, topic. Basing platforms uh, during this period three had uh, floors made of fire bricks, but also of pottery shirts. They were equipped with terracotta pipes or uh, fire brick drains connected to uh, gutters. And, but there was also in uh, Nochero wooden drains. In contrast, very few architectural remains have been excavated for period four. Um, the ceramic assemblage from this period uh, shows a combination of Indus type ceramic um, that you have here, for example, along with the late Kuli B uh, style ceramics, one example is here, and also pottery related to the Oxy civilization in uh, Central Asia. So um, I move now uh, to the southern part of the Indus Valley in uh, the present Sindh province. 
a region where the initial development of urbanism and its expansion during the first half of the Indus period remained more difficult to address. Indeed, um, many sites uh, buried beneath the thick sedimentary deposits of the massive flood plains remained unidentified or inaccessible to excavation, while others have been damaged or destroyed by agricultural or industrial projects. This is a case, for example, in Makadro Daru, which is a very important site uh, in Sindh. For many sites, the earlier phases of the Indus civilization, the early centuries, um, these phases are deeply buried beneath the occupations from the second half of the Indus period. And this is the case, for example, at Mohenjo Daro. Levels from the first Indus period have been reached only in the deep soundings dug by uh, Mackey, that you have here, but also by Wheeler and Dells. And um, it is also important to note that. Um, there were, all, there were also Kotiji potsherds that had been reported in the lowest levels of these soundings. So this occupation of the early centuries exists, but it cannot be uh, reachable for extensive excavations. Other sites did not provide substantial data on this first Indus period, or they were too eroded, such as Amri in Sindh, um, that provided only pottery kilns for this period. And um, at Kotichi, for example, um, where um, there were there quite a few architectural structures that had been exposed for the Harappan period compared to the pre Indus period. So, question of erosion and um, excavation. So in order to substantiate the models of gradual evolution of urbanism in the lower Indus Valley, we had to find a site where uh, remains from the first Indus periods could be preserved and extensively excavated. The site of Chanudaro, known in the archaeological literature as one of the major uh, Indus craft production centers, had, for our point of view, <laughs> this great potential. Um, I just briefly remind that this site was discovered in 1931 by Majumdar from the Archaeological Survey of India, and that it was excavated during one field season only in 1935-36 by the first American archaeological expedition to India under the supervision of Ernest McKay. At that time, the site of Chanudaro comprised uh, three ancient mounds uh, here, one number one, two and three, that roughly covered an area of about six hectares, but the site very eroded should extend on a much, uh, on a much larger uh, area in the surrounding plain beyond uh, its current limits. Several Harappan architectural levels associated with a rich collection of ceramics and various artifacts have been excavated. Um, the Harappa II level, which is um, represented here by this uh, plan on the right side, is uh, certainly the best preserved. It contains buildings made of fire bricks, um, which were grouped around uh, streets, and uh, but also um, an elaborate system, um, I mean, elaborate and well preserved um, uh, hydraulic structures. You have an example here. Mackay also reported craft quarters associated with uh, stone seal, bead, weights, and uh, metal objects manufacturing. Mackay's stratigraphic sequence has recently been revised in light of comparative studies with the Nochero pottery sequence. Uh, you have the result of this uh, uh, revised sequence here. It appeared that uh, the ceramic material ascribed to the first Indus period here uh, occurs only in the cutting, I mean, the deep levels of the cutting, in the deep levels of the trenches, and in Mount 3. However, a very few architectural remains were associated to this uh, ceramics only uh, isolated portions of drains and pavements in fire brick. And um, in this period, one ceramics were also found at the level of uh, 
massive mud brick structures found below the Harapatu architectural level, but uh, not excavated. Uh, Mackay interpreted this massive mud brick structure that you can see here in gray uh, as, uh, I quote, solid platforms such as this um, well known at Mohenjo Daru, where they were expressly constructed to raise buildings beyond the reach of floods. The revised sequence led us to propose a new schematic, uh, schematic reconstruction of Mount 2 and Mount 3 occupations. And uh, as you can see here, the upper part of this mount belong to, um, in fact, a string, um, strongly eroded single mound. The occupation of the second half of the Indus uh, period is represented here in um, red and uh, pink. And the, the Indus period one levels represented in blue gray uh, forms uh, the largest part of the site occupation. But as I mentioned before, uh, this um, occupation remained little excavated. When we undertook the first excavations at Chanudaro in 2015 and 16, we immediately observed that these massive mud brick structures identified by Mackay were not artificial platforms, but they were in fact a proportion of mud brick walls uh, embedded in fallen bricks. These walls delimited housing units associated with painted ceramics. Uh, to be dated to uh, from the first in this period only. Between uh, 2017 and uh, 2020, and also in 22, uh, the excavations were extended to a total area of more than uh, 6,500 square meters. And um, these excavations provided um, major data on the Indus period one, uh, uh, urbanism, architecture, and material culture, but also new data on the transition between the Indus period one and period two. In uh, some areas here and here, we have uh, reached a depth of 2.5 meters below, uh, below the present ground levels. And uh, we identified at least seven architectural levels belonging to the same occupation level dated from um, the late phase of Indus period one. These levels include uh, phases of building, renewal, rebuilding, and abandonment. And uh, I just wanted to say that uh, it was difficult to go uh, much deeper uh, due to the level of the water table, which was much higher than in the 1930s. To, to refine the chronology, we have dated 14 samples from different areas. Um, they are represented here on the right. And um, their calibrated results were consistent with the relative chronology based on pottery. Um, as you can see here and, and here, they place the last uh, occupation phase of this uh, Indus period one settlement in the same chronological range. So uh, it means that the breakdown or transition between Indus period one and two at Chanudaro uh, can now be firmly dated around 2300 BC. Through extensive excavations, we now have a good idea of how the city from the first century of the Indus civilization was built and organized. As you can see here on the right, um, this city shows a very dense urban network and a general layout characteristic of other planned cities. The space is divided into neighborhoods or blocks oriented with a northwest southeast axis. And these neighborhoods are delimited by a hierarchy of connected streets, lanes, narrow passages uh, less than 1.5 meters wide, but also dead end passages like on this example here. Street one that we have called uh, the main street um, here uh, measure uh, seven meters wide on its southern part and it gradually uh, narrows to the north. It seems to have been at the heart of this part of the city 
and on either side of um, the street, the ground level was uh, covered with small pebbles or pottery shirts to protect the base of the walls in mud brick. The streets also had a long drain here installed into the masonry of the wall bordering block uh, number four. And these streets all this street also had uh, water storage jars and um, drainage jars. Jars used as cesspits and drains were also found in uh, the perpendicular lanes. It is interesting to note that these lanes were also inclined to drain water uh, from the main street to uh, the east or west, so from the street here to east and west. At least uh, seven blocks were uncovered on either side of the main street on this uh, plan. Uh, the housing units within the blocks can be identified um, by their distinct field colors. Overall, the blocks show a certain homogeneity and stability through time. A significant change in the general layout um, of this part of the city was only observed here um, in the southern portion of the main street. Um, we found uh, in particular three levels of poorly preserved buildings below the street. At Chanuda Ro, um, the city from the first Indus period was not in fire brick, like the one in the second period, but it was built in mud brick. Uh, mud brick was not limited to a single size model like other sites, and the walls uh, had a varying thickness. The use of fire brick represented uh, in dark red on this plan, you have an example here, uh, was more occasional at this time. And as uh, other in the cities, fire bricks were used um, mostly for uh, drains and other sanitary structures, but also for building pillars and buttresses, uh, like this example, or for building spacings, integrating into the bud brick masonry. In most cases, like uh, this one on the bottom left, this spacing had a protective or structural function, but they can also be decorative. Uh, fire brick was also used uh, for building storage compartments, usually filled with uh, ceramics. There is no evidence of brick robbing, except in very few cases, but uh, they are not systematic. It is clear that the mud brick walls were not the foundation of architectures in fire brick, which would be, from a point of view, questionable from a structural point of view, given the erosion, uh, rains, and um, flooding episodes. At Chanudaro, there is a functional specialization of the different neighborhoods. Here, the block four, five, six, seven, and also the northwestern area here um, are most uh, residential quarters. Uh, this block number six that you have uh, here on the left contains, for example, eight to 10 uh, adjoining houses over an area of almost 1,000 square meters. And this block uh, provided with three uh, different architectural levels. Most uh, houses are quite modest in size, uh, eight to 10 meters long uh, by four to five meters wide. Uh, they have a tripartite plan with uh, two different patterns. The first one, uh, which is illustrated here by house uh, age, comprised, as you can see, um, so a courtyard at the front of the house, two uh, rectangular uh, or small uh, rooms in the center and uh, storage uh, cells at the back. Uh, this model of house is also known as Nochero. The second model uh, illustrated here by house um, G is um, the most widespread and shows a quadrangular or L-shaped courtyard surrounded by small rooms and cells of various sizes. Some houses were built with rooms at different levels to the various phases of construction and renovation. That's why uh, their entrance or thresholds between the rooms were um, mostly equipped with two or three steps. 
to adapt to the topography of the ground and to ensure the stability of rooms, the builders have also constructed structural re reinforcements or buttresses in fire bricks, as well as uh, thicker mud brick walls, in particular around the storage cells. The thickness of some walls suggests that houses had a terrace roof or an upper uh, story. Courtyards with a surface of 9 to uh, 15 square meters were um, like this one or this one were multi-purpose spaces for cooking, storing and crafting activities. They frequently provided with uh, painted jars, black slip jars uh, that were semi-buried or installed into a mud brick compartment like in Nochero. And uh, these jars were placed at the center or in the corner of these courtyards. The kitchen area consists um, uh, frequently of uh, hearth um, installed into, um, uh, into a line of uh, mud brick or clay, as well as uh, pots and jars uh, in, inside which we uh, found uh, terracotta cakes. Other rooms provided with uh, niches and storage compartments, as I mentioned before, uh, full of ceramic vessels. Overall, the houses yielded very large quantities of ceramics and various objects. Uh, although the material culture of Chanudaro is not the main uh, subject of this talk, I briefly present a selection of objects found in the residential areas. So various types of uh, ceramics. Here are uh, nice examples of painted ceramic decorated with vegetal motifs, uh, which uh, show strong comparisons with the ceramic assemblage for, uh, from the first in this period at Nochero. Other examples of painted ceramics decorated with vegetal motifs and animal motifs. And here we have a selection of terracotta, stone, faience, shell, and uh, metal objects. It, in, it includes this uh, selection includes on the top um, examples of rare seals found um, um, in this uh, first Indus period livers, and also an example of a unicorn figurine, which is quite rare in, the, in this uh, territory. And uh, here, uh, for example, a tiger figurine bearing a uh, collar. The residential areas also provided evidences of water management systems and sanitary facilities, which are, uh, which are however, absent in uh, the specialized craft quarter that we will see later. Uh, these structures prefigure south of the second Indus period, and uh, they are already um, placed in the important axis of the city. All types of structures already exist. Um, there are wells uh, excavated by uh, Mackay and Majumdar. Um, there are gutters, drains, pipes, paved um, bedrooms, cesspits, sump pots. And uh, as it was shown by my colleague Alexandre Oudas, um, these structures were present in much lower density during the first Indus period than during the second one. Um, to the south of block five, we have also uncovered a superposition of at least uh, three phases of long drains used from the end of the first Indus period to the beginning of the second Indus period. These structures are very important for understanding the evolution of the city layout from one period to another one. And uh, they attest to successive reconstructions and a form of urban continuity in the planning system. As I said before, the density of these uh, sanitation structures increased significant, significantly uh, during the second Indus period before decreasing in, uh, during the Indus um, period three. To the east of the main street, um, we excavated specialized craft uh, neighborhoods that we call uh, the lapidary quarter um, blocks two and three here in the south uh, are indeed um, divided into distinct functional areas or buildings which provided with huge, huge amounts of contextualized artifacts and craft indicators. These 
artifacts illustrate all the steps of bead and ornament manufacturing, ranging from mapping, cutting, preforming um, of the different materials to the perforating or polishing of the objects. These um, remains are mainly associated with agate cornelian and steel-type working, but also to a lesser extent with other various stone working, faience bead manufacturing, and shell working. To the northwest of this uh, quarter, uh, we uncover the large building that you have here, um, which is about 20 meters long by uh, 10 meters wide, which includes to the north, uh, 12 um, quadrangular cells of various sizes. This building had an outer facing in fire brick uh, integrated into the masonry. And uh, also here on uh, the top right here, um, a stepped entrance also equipped with outer facings in fire bricks. You have uh, the picture of these steps here. This building comprised uh, to the south uh, here, uh, larger rooms and a courtyard, which yielded an abundant archaeological material, um, black sleep jars and painted jars in the corner of the room. But also we found uh, animal bones, including total plastrons, various craft indicators uh, containing, for example, uh, this deposit of 900 preforms of microbeads and uh, this uh, nice composite tool made of an antler tine and a copper-based metal pin. In the center uh, of the crafting area here, we excavated several workshops or uh, craftsmen houses. Um, these houses had the same plan than in the residential area, but they provided huge amounts of craft indicators associated with agate cornelian, stereotype, and shell working, along with hundreds of tools, mainly uh, shirt blades, bladelets, drills, a great variety of uh, artifacts. On the edge of uh, this uh, quarter, um, another area separated from the houses by a thicker wall was totally dedicated to firing activities. Its internal uh, configuration consists of small rooms and cells filled with terracotta nodules and bird sediments. The superimposition of these uh, structures built for uh, varying times of use, but without any phase of abandonment, indicates a continuous crafting activity. This firing area also includes hearth, cooking pots, sagas, and here a large uh, structure of uh, 4.5 meters long, which is maybe a um, double chamber kiln. This um, kiln provided um, a lot of overfire shirts, um, uh, which um, bearing on the inner part uh, some fire talc, and also uh, fragments of um, flakes, cylinders, and fire talc, and also this um, stereotype beads on the fire talc support. South of block two, uh, block three was also occupied by craftsmen's houses that yielded large quantities of craft indicators, including, as you can see here on uh, the bottom, many polishers used for uh, stone beads. It is also worth stating that many evidences of stone beads and ornament manufacturing were also collected in the residential area. Overall, uh, their study, I mean, the study of these artifacts from the craft quarters and the residential area, um, their study by Florine Marchand based on PIPO technological and useware analysis um, is not yet completed due uh, to the voluminous collections uh, of this artifact that comprise, um, I would say, um, tens of thousands of artifacts, but it has already raised important conclusions we can thus demonstrate that Chanudaru was from the early centuries of the Indus period, a major center for the production and distribution of stone beads, especially in agate cornelian. The diversity of the raw materials, the variety of products and tools, but also the artifact distribution suggest a massive production developed in a relatively short time in view of the stratigraphic data 
and um, perhaps managed by a cooperation of specialized craftsmen with various skills adapting to each raw material worked with an extremely well mastered technique. The use of material resources most often coming from distant region also shows the multiplicity and dynamism of regional and supra-regional interactions that could have generated for sure an, increasing, um, an increasingly uh, sorry, complex social network and uh, undoubtedly created a context favorable to the development of urbanism in the uh, Indus Valley. The last uh, field season at Chanudaro conducted, uh, so in January, February 23, uh, brought additional data that helped to better understanding the expansion of the first Indus period settlement. We also clarified some questions about the stratigraphic sequence of the site and the transition between the three Indus periods. According to McKay, Mount 1 here on the southern part of the site and uh, Mount 2 were originally the same uh, mound, but major floods would have separated these two parts of the site. Thick layers of alluvial sediments would have been then deposited between these uh, two uh, mounds. Due to logistic issues following the terrible floods in Pakistan and this last summer, it was not possible to carry out the core drilling program to work on this question and uh, to identify possible indicators of ancient flooding episodes. But we focused the excavation work on Mount 1 that was quite little investigated in the 1930s compared to Mount 2. Indeed, the complete sequence of occupation um, in Mount 1, which uh, rises uh, today uh, six meters above the plain, is still unknown. And we assumed that a large part of it could have also been occupied during the first Indus period. So this year, we opened uh, two trenches, uh, trench four excavated on the top of the mound at the location of Mackay's and Majunda soundings. A revealed a high density of architectures made of fire bricks that were ascribed to the second Indus period based on a pottery analysis. These buildings belong to residential quarters that can be dated to the very beginning of this uh, Indus period too. Some buildings belong to architectural levels that uh, partly overlap with buildings reported by Mackay. This is the case for the eastern and central areas here. And um, they include um, uh, large quadrangular buildings, um, portions of drains, basin platforms, and cesspits, as we can see here on uh, the corner of the image. These levels were settled immediately on architectural levels in Mudbrick from the first Indus period. The Western area here was occupied by two partially collapsed set of architectures. And uh, here a street, um, this um, area was not, um, and the architectures were not reported uh, and identified at the time of Mackay's excavation. These um, areas yielded numerous archaeological material, including uh, various uh, ceramics, lithic tools, and uh, as shown on this example, a necklace made of uh, 128 tubular lapis lazuli beads. In the northwest uh, area of this bench four, so this northwest area, we excavated a group of rooms, including earth, pits, compartments and a nice collection of pottery and artifacts. Three different uh, architectural phases were identified and again these levels were installed immediately on mud brick architectures from the first Indus period. Trench 5 was open on the eastern slope of Mount 1 with the objective to verify the existence and the thickness of the first Indus period occupation and as for Trench 4 to better understand the transition between the first and the second Indus periods. We also questioned the existence of an occupation from the third Indus period or Juka period which was not identified before during my case uh, excavation. 
The surface of uh, that we had excavated uh, quickly provided with um, a thick layer of uh, mud brick deposits uh, that are to be ascribed to the first Indus period. Uh, they were associated with these um, painted jars and uh, typical first Indus period potsheds. And uh, these architectural uh, remains include groups of rooms and courtyards with large uh, jars and earth, and we have um, at least uh, three or four uh, different architectural levels in mud brick for this uh, period. Above the ruins of this occupation, so on the top of the trench, we excavated four levels with fire brick architectures dated to the second Indus period based on uh, ceramics. These levels were much disturbed by the installation of later drainage structure. At the top of the trench, we also found an occupation of the third Indus period Dukar, which seemed to reuse some of the uh, older fire brick architecture. And this occupation was also partly settled on mud brick architecture from uh, Indus period one. Another Dukar occupation, maybe dated from a later phase of posterior to the Indus civilization, was also identified here at the foot of the mound. Uh, and it was again directly settled on ruins from the first Indus period. This discovery of Jukar material was not surprising since uh, we had already identified in 22 uh, some Jukar levels in several areas located at the western foot of Mount Two. So I now come to the general conclusions that we can draw from our excavation work at Chanudaro to document the development and evolution of uh, urbanism during uh, the Indus period. And I would like to say that these conclusions could evolve according to the new data that will be acquired uh, in Mount One during our next excavations. As mentioned earlier, the city built in fire brick known from the previous excavations has to be dated from the second half of the Indus period. This city is not built on a massive mud brick platforms, but immediately above the ruins of the Indus period one settlement. In the current uh, state of data, we did not identify in Mount Two evidences of huge leveling of foundation work, such as those observed in Noshero, uh, but the situation could be different in uh, Mount One um, due to the stratigraphic thickness of the first Indus period occupation. Um, this occupation leaves little doubt that the first Indus period settlement at Chanudaro was much more extended than expected. And um, the stratigraphy shows that um, this occupation is four to five meters higher than the source of the late period one in Mount Two. So it means that at this stage of research, we cannot exclude uh, that um, there could be, um, cannot exclude, sorry, the presence of pre indus levels, but um, the water table is too high to reach the virgin soil at the location of Mount Two. That's why we expect a lot from Mount One excavation. So uh, regarding the first Indus period settlement, uh, we can say that this settlement shows a planning system, a dense urban network, the major use of mud brick, a well-developed water management system, but um, their density is less than during Indus period two. Um, there are also diversified and sophisticated craft productions, a social logic in the special organization of crafting activities, but there are uh, some categories of materials that are quite little represented during this Indus period one, especially seals, metal objects, piles ornaments, or cubic weight, or um, there are categories of materials totally absent. The preliminary conclusions of uh, the new excavations in Mont One also demonstrate that the Jukar style material culture occurred during the third Indus period and seems to have lasted after the end of the Indus civilization. At Chanudaro, the Jukar settlement was installed in different areas dispersed from Mont Three uh, 
to mount one and probably during distinct occupation phases. This period is associated with important transformation in the material culture, in the settlement pattern, and also in the architectural techniques and in the subsistence economy uh, based on preliminary uh, um, study uh, by my colleague Margarita Tenberg. The Duca occupation uh, when, uh, was settled in Mont Juan when uh, the later had already been formed and eroded since a long time. And it must have occupied the entire slope of Mont Juan in this part of the site. So uh, I stop here and I would like, of course, to thank all the scientific institutions, partners and sponsors listed on this uh, slide, uh, which uh, made it possible our field work in Channel Garo. And um, the new data presented today are the result of a uh, collective and collaborative research work whose main contributors are shown on this slide. I also thank the other team members, workers, local students, young researchers, many of them participate to our field training programs in SIND, but also to a training stays in our laboratory in France. And finally, I uh, would like to dedicate this presentation in the memory of uh, Michael Jensen, who passed away last year, and who brought a sounding contribution on the Indus urbanism and architecture. Um, and this nice picture was uh, taken, I think, in Moindo Daro by uh, Catherine Jarige in the beginning of the 80s. So thank you very much for your uh, attention. <laughs>